This UCSD TV program is presented by University of California Television. Like what you learn? Visit our website or follow us on Facebook and Twitter to keep up with the latest programs. Good evening, folks. Um, welcome to this year's annual DeWitt Higgs Memorial Lecture. I'm Stephen Adler. I'm the provost of Earl Warren College and a professor in the Department of Theater and Dance here at UC San Diego. And it's my uh, great pleasure on behalf of Chancellor Pradeep Kosla and the administration of UCSD to welcome you to this year's Higgs Lecture, which is sponsored by Earl Warren College the Law and Society Program, and the California Western School of Law. The Higgs Lecture is designed to present an evening of stimulating discourse on a vital contemporary legal topic. You can find biographical information about DeWitt Higgs on the back page of your program. He was an important member of the University of California's Board of Regents in a very turbulent time, and we're honored to uh, call our lecture after him. Uh, our topic and our guest speaker are selected annually by the Faculty Advisory Committee of the Law and Society Program here at UCSD. And uh, for those of you who are not familiar with it, this is a very popular interdisciplinary minor that features faculty from several, several of our academic departments as well as from California Western School of Law. We believe that tonight's lecture by Professor Susan Crawford will ful fulfill the goals of the Higgs Lecture in exemplary fashion. I extend particular welcome and thanks to DeWitt Higgs' son, Craig Higgs, Esquire, of the law firm Higgs, Fletcher, and Mack. Uh, they have been a constant supporter of this program. I would like now to introduce my friend and colleague from the other side of the city, uh, the Dean of the California Western School of Law, Niels Schaumann, to introduce Professor Crawford. Thank you. Thank you, Provost Adler. Um, I'm very happy to be with you here tonight to introduce uh, Susan Crawford. Um, I've seen the presentation. It is excellent. I think you'll want to stay till the end. It's, uh, it's really good. Uh, Susan is the John A. Riley Visiting Professor in Intellectual Property at Harvard currently. She is uh, a professor and on the faculty at the Benjamin N. Cardozo School of Law in New York, a fellow at the Roosevelt Institute, and a co-director of the Berkman Center at Harvard. She is the author of Captive Audience, The Telecom Industry and Monopoly Power, in the New Gilded Age. And that's the book that is available for purchase with, uh, with, at the book signing at the end of this program. Um, she's also served as Special Assistant to the President for Science, Technology, and Innovation Policy, and co-led the FCC transition team between the Bush and Oma Obama administrations. She's also served as a, mayor of my, may, uh, as a member of Mayor Michael Bloomberg's Advisory Council on Technology and Innovation. Ms. Crawford was formerly a visiting Stanton professor of the First Amendment at Harvard's Kennedy School, a visiting professor at Harvard Law School, and a professor at the University of Michigan Law School. As an academic, she teaches internet law and communications law. She was a member of the board of directors of ICANN, the internet governing body, from 2005 till 2008, and is the founder of One Web Day, a global Earth Day for the internet that takes place each September 22nd. One of Fast Company's most influential women in technology. Um, she's also an IP3 awardee. One of Prospect Magazine's top 10 brains of the digital future. And one of Time Magazine's Tech 40, the most influential minds in tech. Ms. Crawford received her BA and her JD de degree from Yale University. She served as a clerk for Judge Raymond Deary of the US District Court for the Eastern District of New York 
and was a partner at Wilmer Cutler, now Wilmer Hale, in D.C. until the end of 2002 when she left that firm to enter the legal academy. Um, Susan also is a violist, and that is something that we actually have in common, so uh, that was fun to learn. And she lives in New York City. Um, California Western is happy to cooperate with uh, the Earl Warren College to bring you another speaker in this series, which I think has been a really, truly outstanding series of speakers. Uh, we do this every year. It's usually around this time. And so if you're around uh, in April of next year, please check out that event as well. It'll be good. Thank you very much, and I now give you Susan Crawford. Thank you, Dean, and thank you to Provost Adler, and it's such an honor to be here for the Higgs Lecture. Uh, Craig Higgs is so kind to support this, and it's also wonderful because Cambridge, Massachusetts has had the worst winter, really awful winter, for the last four months, and now I'm here. What, you know, what a joy, and I just spotted a skateboard. So I grew up in Santa Monica. And when I was in seventh grade, the thing I did on the weekends was to put my poor dog on a leash and then yell, cat, to him. And the, and the guy was so nervous, he would go running down the street with his ears perked up, looking for the cat, and I'd be dragged along on the skateboard behind him, which I thought was, you know, terrifying for him, clever of me, and uh, really brings me back to my roots to see the skateboard here. So thank you for bringing that. Also, there's a dog here, so all the stories are going together. Uh, so in the great city of New York right now, there's an exhibit at the New York Historical Society, and it features a dress worn by Mrs. Astor in 1908. And the dress is actually <laughs> an image of electricity because electricity was so exciting to Americans at the beginning of the 20th century that their imaginations were fired by it. They'd never seen anything like it. In fact, when electricity was first introduced in the Midwest in the late 19th century, men fell to their knees. They couldn't believe the streets were lit at night. Well, today, the electricity of the 21st century is high-speed internet access. It is also astounding. Like electricity in the early 20th century, though, high-speed internet access is today controlled by a series of very large private trusts. Same thing happened with electricity. You may not know this, especially students sort of take electricity for granted. But actually, when FDR was running for office in the early 30s, the big policy issue was what to do about the electrification of America. 90% of farmers in the 30s didn't have electricity at the same time that Mrs. Astor was wearing that dress in New York City and all the rich kids in the big cities had it. Farmers didn't. And FDR took on this issue in the presidential campaigns, took on the special interests behind the trusts that controlled electrification in America, and was determined to make this into a reasonably priced utility, world-class quality of service available to all. It took a lot of effort on his part. Uh, you know, he did a lot as president, all of you students have already figured this out, and um, passed a big piece of legislation, the Public Utilities Holding Act, that put the electrical companies under regulation for the first time, and made sure that there was cheap electricity available where those companies weren't serving people in the form of these very large hydropower stations, and also made sure that rural areas were able to keep their character as uh, places where people wanted to live by making sure that reasonably priced electricity was there. Importantly, Roosevelt also felt that there should be a constraint on the private trusts that were selling electricity to Americans in the form of city power, city authority, even if retained and not used, to build their own utilities, their own electrification facilities, to route around the local monopolies in their cities. This was a right-left issue. There were lots of rock rib conservatives my own great-grandfather among them in uh, New Jersey, for example, who hated the power of the electrification trusts and backed this 
disaggregation of power to make sure that we could move forward as a country. Now we take it for granted. Well, all right, fast forward. Today, when it comes to high-speed Internet access, a handful of extraordinarily powerful companies have essentially divided the market for high-speed Internet access. You take wires, we'll take wireless. On the wired side for high-speed Internet access, most Americans have just one choice for high capacity internet connectivity, and it's their local cable monopoly. The largest of these companies is Comcast. Second largest is Time Warner Cable. They called it the summer of love in the late 90s. The cable companies divided up their systems, swapped cable systems so that they would cluster their operations, which makes sense from, as an economic matter. Keep your overhead low. That's why they never enter each other's territories. They never enter each other's footprints. They don't compete. And the telephone companies over their copper wires have backed away, mostly, from competing with cable for wired internet access. On the wireless side, that's AT&T and Verizon. And they have just about all the profit for wireless high-speed internet access and very low consumer churn. Most of the subscriptions, they're giant companies. Here's the picture, not the most beautiful graphics for students. You're used to things kind of moving. But just take a look at this one. See the speeds of 25 megabits and above. Most of that territory is covered by Cable. Cable is the technology for most Americans, somewhere between 77, 85 percent of Americans are using and have only the choice of their local cable monopoly for that service. DSL is uh, the name for internet access over a copper wire, the old telephone wire. That can't keep up with the speeds that cable can provide. There's only one more wire to know about. So I told you about copper wire, lower, lower capacity, lower speeds. There's cable in the middle, which is capable of very fast downloads, pretty cramped uploads, as you've probably noticed if you try to upload graphics or pictures, but fast downloads. And then the only other wire to know about is fiber optic, which is thin glass tubes through which lasers are shot, right, and unlimited capacity. Fiber is, we believe, essentially future-proof. For the next 50 years, this is the wired connection that's going to have the most credibility in the world. This is what most people are going to be using. In America, very few fiber connections, but for uh, over speeds of over 100 megabits per second, fiber, the yellow part of the bar, has half those subscriptions, but not very many Americans have that available to them. In fact, cable has been grabbing the lion's share of new high-speed internet access subscriptions for several years now. We deregulated this entire sector back in 2002. The FCC then, Federal Communications Commission, Chairman Michael Powell at the time, um, was convinced that competition would protect Americans and we didn't need any more re regulation. What we wanted to do was unleash the DSL actors and the cable modem companies to compete with each other. And that would protect consumers from abuses, from price gouging, all these other things. But since then, the cable actors have updated their technology to make it capable of much faster downloads. Meanwhile, the companies selling copper wires, largely AT&T and Verizon, have decided not to invest in fiber to the home. Which, because that would require digging up their copper wires and replacing it with fiber. So cable has won the American appetite for high capacity connections. Something like 90% of new subscriptions in 2012 went to cable, and DSL is really losing. You can see this in less beautiful form here. The purple line going downward, that's telco, uh, new uh, broadband subscriptions. Uh, the bright blue line is cable. Here's another way of looking at this, at and Verizon, very little change in their wired high-speed data subscribers, lots for Comcast and Time Warner Cable. And here's the real picture. People are fleeing DSL uh, because if you want to be dealing with high-capacity communications, today we might talk about video, 
but it could be anything. It could be all the sensor data coming in from around the city, could be telemedicine applications, could be high-speed uh, educational applications. That's not possible over copper wires, by and large. So the blue line going down is AT&T DSL. That's their loss in subscribers over time. Meanwhile, Comcast and Time Warner Cable keep growing. So this is great for Comcast. They are making more and more money from the same number of subscribers. Here's a little very simple chart showing their average revenue per each subscriber going up steadily over time. Comcast is a terrific American company. I have nothing against them. But they are unconstrained at this point by either oversight from the federal government or local authorities or competition because they face just one nationwide competitor, and that's Verizon Fiber, Verizon Fios, which serves today about 14% of Americans. Fios overlaps Comcast territory, well, only about 17% of Comcast territory. And that means that in the rest of Comcast's footprint, no Fios, and Verizon has announced several times over the last few years that it has no plans to expand Fios. This is Brian Roberts, the very calm, well-mannered CEO of Comcast, speaking to investors in 2011. He's saying, in our territories, in our footprint, remember they don't ever compete with Time Warner Cable or Cox or any of the other big players, we're about 35% penetrated. He means that about a third of the households have signed up for, for high-speed data with Comcast. He expects 90 to 100% market share in that footprint because their only competitor, again, is Verizon Fios. He likes that position because Americans are going to be wanting to access more and more high-capacity data, and Comcast will be right there taking part of the revenue uh, whatever the applications want to be gathering, and also incrementally, very gently, uh, raising prices on uh, consumers. So that's the wired side. Here's the wireless side. As I mentioned, uh, AT&T and Verizon have the lion's share. In fact, just about all the economic profit on the wireless side goes to them. Wireless is a better story competitively than wired access in America. T-Mobile, yay for T-Mobile, um, they're a real maverick. They are signing up people with very adventurous data plans and unlimited data. Uh, but still, Verizon and AT&T, um, who now really are wireless companies, we should stop thinking of them so much as wired players. This chart shows that the percentage of their revenue now coming from wireless is going up and up and, and most of their profits. And this allows the wireless companies to continue to, like the wired side of the story, um, make more money from the same number of people. So their revenue per subscriber continues to go up. In Europe, much more competitive market. That very simple chart shows that uh, revenue going down because it's much more competitive. So again, most of the revenue for Verizon uh, is coming from wireless. And Verizon, at this point, we should watch them, because they're really pulling away on the wireless side. They are enormous, and they're growing more quickly than AT&T um, and making lots of money on this. Nothing wrong with making money, great American thing. But it, uh, it as I'll demonstrate, uh, might be a drag on our future as a country. Because here's what's going on. All four of these companies are in harvesting mode. They've made their investments, capital expenditures, that's what CapEx stands for here, and they're now reaping the rewards of those investments. So let's compare the company's revenue that comes in every year to the amount they're investing in new networks. So between 2009 and 2013, these four companies, Comcast, Time Warner Cable, at and Verizon, made collectively about $1.4 trillion. Most of that was made on the wireless side. Um, and that's an increase of 117% over the five-year period between 2001 and 2005. And all four companies spent about 15%, just 15% of that enormous revenue on building new networks, upgrading what they've already installed. Comcast is the most successful at this with a very low uh, percentage of their revenue going to investing in new networks. This is harvesting. This is reaping the rewards of the investments you've already made. And 
Who's making more money from this? Well, the shareholders of these companies. So buybacks and dividends, the ways that we reward shareholders, are accelerating steeply. These are great investments for shareholders. The question is whether the incentives of these companies to plow money back to their shareholders are aligning with the industrial policy, economic policy objectives of the country as a whole. So shareholder returns are now exceeding capital expenditures for AT&T and for Time Warner Cable, and a huge chunk of capital expenditures for uh, Comcast. This is common across America, uh, that companies are now reaping rather than investing. And it's a problem for students, because investment indicates expansion into new areas, new forms of making a living, rather than just staying with what you've got and making greater returns from it. So here, shareholders, again, doing extremely well, that uh, shares are getting more expensive. That's what buybacks means. You're taking shares off the market, thus raising the value of existing shares. And investments are not such a great percentage over time. Now, some of you may be aware that Comcast, number one in this market, is now planning to merge with Time Warner Cable. So how could it be? How could Shamu and Godzilla merge? How does that happen? Well, this is a very big deal, because the merged company is going to, if and when the merger is approved, pass two-thirds of American homes. By pass, that's kind of a telecom term of art. It means that their network already exists in the neighborhoods of those homes and would not have to be further built out in order to connect those homes, whether or not the homes are actually subscribing now. And of the homes that are actually subscribing now, uh, the merged company would be covering 30% of high-speed internet access subscribers. Now, Comcast in 2011 merged with uh, Time uh, NBCU, NBC Universal, one of the six great uh, media conglomerates in the United States. And the book that I wrote, Captive Audience, tracks that merger, explains what the deal meant and how it came to be over the last uh, 15 years or so of telecommunications history. Most Americans who subscribe to high-speed internet access also subscribe to pay TV. Comcast, because it's vertically integrated, has both the input of programming under its umbrella and is also a distribution network, has a tremendous advantage in the marketplace because it can keep infrastructure distribution competition at bay by using its advantage in the programming market. So let me explain. Because so many uh, Americans want to have programming, especially sports, you can't get sports without having a cable TV package. Uh, and a lot of the really, this is a golden era of television, and a lot of those great shows you can't get with having this great big golden bundle of stuff that you can't take apart, right? Because Comcast is so big already, it pays much less per subscriber than any little new infrastructure provider would pay. It gets volume discounts from the programming and sports community. This means that any new wire provider entering Comcast territory has to enter both markets at once. It has to pay much more per subscriber for programming than Comcast does and build a new wire. That's really hard. So by merging with Time Warner Cable, Comcast builds an even wider moat around its business, makes it even more difficult because of these volume discounts for anybody new to show up. It's a real source of strength. Also because of the merger, Comcast becomes a much larger buyer of programming, uh, can raise, create more uh, boundaries around its networks, can control cable boxes, you know, there are lots of other ways that this makes Comcast into something like a giant kid doing a cannonball into a swimming pool. Every other part of the media ecosystem is affected, and everybody else ends up paying more, dampens innovation. What's interesting about the merger, many things, but it actually just takes what is already a terrible situation and makes it incrementally worse. The merger is, though, focusing 
many Americans on the reality of our infrastructure situation in the country, which is one of great power wielded by these local cable monopolies. And some of you probably read recently that Netflix, with 33 million subscribers, had to capitulate to Comcast in making an agreement with Comcast to pay Comcast directly for the privilege of reaching Netflix's own subscribers. Um, there's a lot of detail behind that story, but that's what happened. And uh, so Netflix didn't have to pay too much for that because it had Comcast at a good moment. Comcast needs to merge with Time Warner Cable. But you will start the next Netflix, the next high capacity application of some kind, especially here with all the emphasis on the sciences and telemedicine, everything else. Comcast can act as a gatekeeper with uh, essentially a terminating monopoly, no way to reach your audience without going through them. It's like trying to get over the George Washington Bridge from Fort Lee, New Jersey, and there's something getting in your way. You're not quite sure what it is. And uh, Comcast can charge whatever it wants for the privilege of getting over that bridge. Today, another fascinating thing about this whole area is that the companies, these this small handful of companies that uh, control high-speed internet access in America are asserting very bluntly that they are First Amendment speakers, just like the New York Times. That here's the claim, that broadband networks are the, are the modern day microphone by which their owners, their owners engage in First Amendment speech. This is a huge and important moment in constitutional law. And all of you who are, might be thinking about lawyers, contemplate this one. We think of the telephone network as just a dumb conduit. It's just the vehicle for our speech. It isn't itself a speaker. We think of the highway or the electricity grid as, again, a basic piece of infrastructure that lets everything else, the free market, happen above it. We don't think of these things as the New York Times themselves with editorial privileges. When you plug something into an electricity jack, it just works. It doesn't have to ask permission. It doesn't get edited. It just happens. If these actors get their way, that won't be the case for high-speed internet access. It will be actually edited according to their own conflicts of interest, uh, you know, relationships with, with content partners, whatever it is they want to do. None of this is evil. It's not malign. But because this market is unconstrained, because there is no oversight, it's like asking a lion to stay away from a gazelle or, you know, a little kid to stay away from a cookie jar. These companies will act this way absent rules uh, or competing networks going in the other direction. So this handful of companies are claiming that they have editorial discretion. Here's their argument. We built the facilities. We made these investments. These facilities carry data. Much of that data is speech. And so we have the First Amendment right to edit that speech. Therefore, and here's the big legal beagle moment, any restraint on our economic power to slice, dice, choose speech is presumptively unconstitutional because you're censoring us. That's the way this works. And the goal for these companies is to just make a single court take this argument seriously. Because once they've done that, this becomes for them a cudgel to be used if either the regulator, the Federal Communications Commission, or Congress tries to restrain their power. If regulation is presumptively unconstitutional, it means every time the Congress does something, a court will second guess whether this is too much of a restraint on speech. We went through this before, by the way, in the early 20th century. It's called the Lochner era, uh, when we believed that restraining um, companies from acting in their own economic self-interest was actually a problem for their due process rights under American law. We're doing it now, again, with the First Amendment. It amounts to a get out of jail card, free card for regulated industries, because as soon as there's some connection to speech, a court has to enter in and review what the Congress or the regulator has done. I've written a lot about this, and uh, a current article is suggesting that instead of focusing on whether or not these guys are speaking, which is kind of a muddled area of law, let's start from the other side of the argument. 
look at all the good reasons that Congress has to carry out economic regulation of basic communications transport networks. General purpose, two-way communications, we need it as a society. And there's a reason to try to constrain the lion when it's going after the gazelle in everybody else's interests. Also arguing that because life is short and we're by nature resilient and cheerful as human beings, or we should be, that at, at the same time we're pursuing oversight of these companies, we could try to constrain them with words, it's going to be really hard. Let's build alternative networks, fiber networks, um, that are controlled or facilitated by cities so that we always have a choice. It's that birch rod in the closet that FDR talked about for electricity. Same thing should exist for communication. So we're not stuck. We're not this captive audience for these uh, monopolistic players. Lots of reasons why Congress should have economic oversight of these networks. We have this long history of non-discriminatory access to roads and communications networks. And we want to make sure that all Americans have access to these facilities and that that access is, in fact, world class. We should lead the world when it comes to infrastructure, roads, and communications. Now, why do we care about non-discriminatory access? This is a, sort of a the nickname for this in law is common carriage. And it's not because these things are necessities, because food's also a necessity and we don't treat it as you know, we don't give everybody non-discriminatory access to food. We don't do it because of uh, market power, because taxis, I know you've never seen a taxi, but in New York City there are a lot of them. Just kidding. Checking to see if you're awake. Um, in, uh, their taxis can uh, compete with buses and with cars, but they're still, and they don't necessarily control markets, but they're still subject to common carriage, non-discrimination uh, regulations. And it's not because they serve everybody. It's because these basic networks, the federal highway system, uh, the phone system, are so closely related to the function of a state. This is what a state is. You know, the civic responsibility is to make sure that our roads and our communications networks function and function well for everybody. There's so many benefits from this. Uh, economic growth, think of what electricity made possible with productivity and quality of life. Um, standardizing the, the availability and the rates for this has had huge effects on every other part of American economy and society. You need a lot of stability and reliability of, for these transactions, for all of these outputs to happen. And this is just, as much as we think of high-speed internet access these days as a luxury, in fact, it's a utility. It's just getting you know, your communication from point A to point D. And we needed to get there in order for you guys to all start your new businesses and take over the world. Uh, making sure that Congress has this kind of non-discriminatory um, economic authority over communications networks spurs economic growth. We'll be able to ensure that everybody in the country has this kind of access. And rural areas can stay rural. You can run your business from a distant place without having to move to a city. It's all good. Another reason why we need economic authority over communications networks is this idea of universality. Now, Americans are so parochial that we use the word universal. What we really mean is everyone in America, right? So universal service is the notion for a telephone system. If you're poor in America, we have a subsidy program to make sure that you can get access to a telephone line. Same thing needs to be present in America for fiber access to your home. We need to create this very large market for development of new ways of making a living, new forms of businesses. Lots of other countries are thinking this way all across Asia. Um, I made a, a visit to South Korea recently, and Japan has the same thing. This is just essential. It's just infrastructure. And we need to create the market that is buying products and creating new businesses. Left to its own devices, private actors providing this kind of high upfront cost infrastructure will not provide universality. They'll cherry pick uh, richer neighborhoods. They'll leave out more rural areas because it's too expensive to serve there, as we saw with electricity. And they will just choose who gets service and who pays what for what. This is becoming an increasing, it already is a terrible problem in America, but it's getting worse and worse. 
uh, that this divide between who has a wire and who doesn't at home is entrenching existing inequality. Because relying on a smartphone for high-speed internet access is like being on a dirt path in comparison to what's possible with a high-capacity wire in your home for medical reasons, for education, or all kinds of things. You need that wire. And it really should be a fiber optic connection. So another reason we need economic authority over a uh, communications network is that America should be looking the rest of the world in the rearview mirror. We're the country that came up with the idea of the internet protocol, for God's sake. And, uh, and yet, uh, when I made this trip to Seoul, same thing happened in Stockholm. People feel, people from those countries coming here feel as if they're taking a rural vacation. That life has slowed down because connectivity is so poor here. In fact, uh, the, the chief operating officer of Stockholm looked at me quite seriously. He said, you know, I think the internet is just going to stop working in America because when I'm standing in Central Park, I can't access Swedish newspapers from my handheld device. I can do that from Johannesburg. I can do it from Rio de Janeiro. I can't do it from Central Park in New York City. What's going on? We, because we thought competition would protect Americans, we just had faith in that starting in 2002. Well, it turns out that where, where consolidation is possible, competition is impossible. And so we're stuck now on this plateau, really, of a second-class network, which is the cable connection to American homes and businesses. And what we will need for the 21st century is high-capacity networks and the, you know, the imaginative possibilities of new businesses that are new ideas, new recipes, new ways of making a living. That's where growth and development and new jobs will come from. Why should a kid, a kid, sorry, see, I can't spell. Why should a kid in Colorado not get a job that a kid in Stockholm can? Uh, this is a big problem for us as a country. That First Amendment argument has a lot of looming power for us. It puts courts, not Congress, in charge of industrial policy for communications. It makes every economic statute or regulation subject to this presumption of unconstitutionality. And it really is a very basic attack on congressional authority to say anything about high-speed internet access in America. Because you wouldn't be able to do it without a lot of judicial scrutiny. Uh, once you make this part of our great commitment to free speech. And we do have a great commitment. In fact, on the Supreme Court these days, it's getting stronger and stronger. It's like this very robust libertarian uh, ideal that we want to protect speech as much as possible. To turn that, that basic American ideal in the service of protecting the economic desires of these high-speed internet access companies seems almost perverse. And yet, if you repeat an argument enough, somebody's going to believe it. And that's what's going on right now here. Their speech actually is completely economic. And they'll say it uh, when they acknowledge what's really going on. They're not actually the New York Times. They are looking at uh, wanting to create the power, a two-sided market. And they're playing games with the connections between their networks, their so-called eyeball networks, the ones you and I are accessing, and other networks outside of the world that are connecting to them and charging for the privilege of reaching their subscribers. Just to simplify this, here's a really lame slide that I obviously created um, showing the two-sided market from the network uh, access provider's perspective. So on your left is a user, a content provider, some high capacity company, could be Netflix, maybe today it is, but tomorrow it could be a company that wants to make it possible for you to be present in a classroom, really present, where the pixels fall away, no latency, and you're able to be part of a discussion, not just passively watching it. That's the actor on the left. They're going to have to pay this terminating monopoly for the privilege of getting to the people on the far right, the user, you and me, who wants to be in the classroom. So phone networks weren't allowed to do this. They were just obligated to carry calls, no matter how interesting or lucrative the call was. We didn't let them exact fees on both sides. Now these actors have the power and are exerting it, as we saw with the Netflix example, to charge both sides of the market. 
Luckily, Justice Roberts of our own uh, Supreme Court has written beautifully on the subject of uh, uh, who gets to claim the credit of the First Amendment in a case that concerned uh, recruiting by the military at law schools in 2006. This was a big problem for law schools. They, they, were, they felt they were being forced to give military recruiters equal access to their facilities at a time when the don't ask, don't tell doctrine and law was in place. And there was great concern at law schools that this was discriminatory, that they were being forced to allow this kind of activity, felt very uncomfortable, so they sued. But the Supreme Court unanimously held that those requirements don't enact, this isn't really about speech. This is not a speech thing. This isn't compelled speech law school. You're not speaking at this point. You're just opening your classrooms. And the same kind of logic applies or should apply to the high-speed internet access providers. And Robert's opinion is very careful in the way that it marshals all the president and president and it examines why uh, law schools were overdoing it. Because what the law schools were actually engaged in is conduct, not speech. There's no message understood when a law school opens its doors, the court said, to the recru recruiters. Similarly, I'd say, no message that Comcast is delivering by charging Netflix more than it would charge StreamPix its own service. This is just an economic moment. No, nothing understood as a message from any recipient. And if there is some speech that they're being forced to carry, that's, it's absolutely incidental to the conduct and here are all those economic reasons why we want to constrain the power of the telecommunications companies. That's our first goal, not censorship. That's not what's going on. And it actually trivializes the First Amendment to say that either what the law schools were worried about or the communications providers today are claiming is the same as being forced as a Jehovah's Witness to say something you don't believe in you know, or to be uh, subject to a prior restraint on your ability to speak. That's not what's going on here. We have this deep belief in the First Amendment for an important reason, and it's not this. It's not making deals. And it can't be that any business conduct, however illegal, becomes constitutionally protected because it has some link to speech. Otherwise, a bank robber can go to the bank, hold up a gun, say, your money or your life to the teller, and then afterwards say, well, that was just my First Amendment right. You know, I get to speak. That can't be, right? Okay, that was oversimplified, but you get the point. Um, so the article in this sort of this strain here is to say we need some common sense when it comes to the First Amendment. We can't just hand over this great uh, belief in American law to these actors because there's no chance that uh, what Congress would want was a particular viewpoint to be expressed by the carriers. It's just that we have these economic ends, just as we do with the highway system and we did with the phone system that should exist. Here's the issue. Because there is no oversight currently uh, under federal law or state law for that matter of high-speed internet access providers, when they're wearing that hat as high-speed internet access providers, they are already now able to edit and we're gonna see more and more of that editing happening. So they have the ability to change the facts on the ground to make themselves look more like the New York Times than we thought they were. So we better act quickly and do something about this situation. So in a nutshell, the carriers really wanna undermine any deference to Congress or the FCC, and they're saying there's this very serious constitutional question at stake, but it's really, very political because we've seen the same move from the pharmaceutical industry, from the tobacco industry. Everybody claims they're a speaker uh, when they're trying to avoid any form of oversight. And here they can change the facts. What we really should be doing, so here comes the optimistic part, is making this upgrade to fiber. Cheap, unlimited capacity, you know, 30 bucks a month in Seoul or in Stockholm. Um, so back to the electrification analogy, Americans didn't understand that electricity was gonna be useful for lots of things domestically until the World's Fairs were held, these physical World's Fairs in the early 20th century. People saw kitchens with lots of electrical appliances and they got the idea that this was possible. So my grandmother always called the electrical bill the light bill because people thought electricity was only good for a single light in the home. 
Google Fiber going on in Kansas City right now. I just got back from Kansas City. I keep making these quests to places where they have high capacity networks. Google Fiber is our, in a sense, our domestic uh, World's Fair. Because when other mayors get to see what high capacity networks make possible, I think they're going to get jealous and want to have that kind of network in their home. It shouldn't necessarily be provided by Google. We don't want to swap out one monopoly for another. But just the firing of the, of the imagination about fiber is, is very important. Because when I went to Stockholm, we actually see this in action. Um, here's Stocab, which is the company that, that Stockholm formed 20 years ago. Um, it's very exciting in a sort of visceral way. We only understand something when we see it. So 20 years ago, 20 years ago, the city fathers, first a relatively conservative mayor, then a more um, socialist mayor in, in Stockholm, decided that they didn't want to be subject to the power of an incumbent for their communications. And so, and they're also very neat people, the Swedes, right? They said, we only want to rip up the streets once. So we're going to do this once. And they put in conduit, which is just a name for the tubes under the street, and unlit fiber. So without the lasers, just the glass tubes, dark fiber it's called, 20 years ago. And the city floated a bond and paid for that. Today, they lease out that dark fiber to many competing uh, home providers, ISPs. And that's why you get fiber to the home access, gigabit access for 30 bucks a month in Stockholm, because this wholesale network's in place. It's like a street grid. And it's overseen by the city. No one incumbent is there. And the city doesn't have an interest in milking profits out of it. So here's Stocab. They, they never actually serve customers directly. They're just providing this wholesale uh, street grid-like infrastructure, making possible this is why Stockholm is the place where 4G wireless access was first available, because they have so much fiber in the ground. That creates lots of capacity for wireless networks to take advantage of. These two things are complementary. You need a lot of fiber for really great wireless connections in, in your city. And Stockholm now is making a lot of money from this, because they paid back the the loans pretty quickly that it took to build that wholesale network. And now they're reaping the rewards uh, from renting out access to um, those, those competing free market companies. So every time someone tells you, oh, no, we can't get cities involved because that's bad for the free market, explain to them that actually this kind of regulatory infrastructure unleashes the free market, makes it possible for competition to exist and not be captured by a single company. Uh, it's a little hard to read this one. When it comes to fiber as a uh, percentage of the broadband installations in America, we're way down the list. We're behind Japan, Korea, Sweden, Estonia, blah, 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 lots and lots of countries. And that's because in these other places, it was part of their economic industrial policy to make sure that fiber to the home and business access was available at a reasonable price. Here's another graphic for. Uh, very high capacity connections, so that's 54 gigabytes. That's a measure of the kind of flow of water, the number of bits you're getting per month. The Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development, that's the group that all gets all the developed nations together, OECD, says that we pay more in America per megabit for 45 megabit speeds and above than any country other than Mexico, Turkey, and Chile. Right? It's more expensive here than almost any other developed country. And I think Americans just don't know this. We think, oh, we're always ahead. It's just not true when it comes to these uh, basic inputs into economic life. So here, I, uh, in Sweden, I uh, was lucky enough to meet lots of people and interview lots of people. It's kind of a quest of mine. And this is Bertolt Nordstrom. He is 93 years old. And he is Sweden's leading online senior citizen. And he writes to me often over email. And he won a prize. It's on his wall, like Sweden's leading uh, senior citizen. He's a wonderful guy. Oh, by the way, go to the gym, right? He belongs to two gyms. Also, be interested in everything. That's another way to stay young, OK? Very curious man. And he loves technology. So he writes to me and says, Susan, get the Rotarians. He believes that Rotary Clubs are the, the answer to progress in America. Get the Rotarians to just demand fiber access. He, and he tells me every month how much he's paying for his gigabit access. And it's down in his uh, apartment block to $25 a month for a gigabit connection. 
you know, unlimited capacity. So it's just like electricity, you just take it for granted. It's always on and it's unlimited. And that means you're never waiting, there's no friction. It's just part of your ability to run your life. So every screen in this building could have connectivity. There's no reason it doesn't, it's just because our communications networks are so second rate that it isn't available. So Barrett wants you to fix this. And oh, this, this is quite a story. This is a kid I met at uh, Univer Science University in Stockholm. And what he's doing there is uh, giving me a virtual reality demonstration. So he put these Oculus uh, things on me. This is why Facebook bought this. Um, these goggles are, now they're heavy, uh, but uh, they'll get much lighter as screens get more advanced. And they might just be a thin membrane around your eyes eventually and makes it possible to be in a fully immersed digital environment. Kids all know about this, but maybe the grown-ups don't. Um, the thing he demonstrated for me was terrifying. I'm afraid of heights. And this was a roller coaster going up. And then he said, all right, look down. And I looked down, and I'm just falling, just free fall. And my stomach was completely convinced that I was in this situation. Right? OK, so for that, that's for games or whatever. But that's the future. That It's not for imagining things, it's for being present in a meeting. Again, the pixels disappear. You're actually there with a high enough resolution uh, connection. And you could be in a classroom, in a meeting, running a business with no friction attached to your communications capacity. This kid is completely confident that he'll have a great job after graduation because there are all these new businesses starting up in Stockholm. Stockholm just launched their first direct nonstop flight to Silicon Valley, and they're convinced that all the entrepreneurs are going to move there because that's where the high capacity networks are. I, you know, we have to tell them it's also really dark and cold, so we're not sure, but, but it's, it is a wonderful place. Oh, here's the advantage. So Stockholm has these really great high capacity networks. What they don't have is the diversity and grit and kind of uh, engagement of Americans. And they were, they're trying to actually synthetically create that. How do we create grit, they asked me. How, how do we do this? Uh, so we have a lot of advantages in America. In my home city of New York, all this grit is certainly there. But we don't have the networks. They're not in place. And meanwhile, here's Comcast saying, all right, we're going to sell electricity. We're going to add it to our, to our bundle. Why not? We've got every other part of it. They're opening up lots of Wi-Fi hotspots, you know, just one giant bundle of all possible communications capacity. The Wi-Fi angle is potentially enormously destabilizing to Verizon and AT&T. If there's so much Wi-Fi provided by a federated Comcast across the country, who needs mobile wireless except for the moments when you're riding down the freeway? So think about that. So here's a picture again of uh, Stockholm. This is this careful network that they built 20 years ago. And they're you know, fixing something perfectly the way the Swedes do. Uh, in Chattanooga, there's a network like this, uh, now 70 bucks for a gigabit connection. Uh, this was built on top of Chattanooga's electrical utility with a certain amount of subsidy, quite a bit, from the federal government and other sources. And it, the mayor of Chattanooga firmly believes that this is the most exciting the city, thing the city has ever done. Thrilled about this, thrilled about the new businesses moving in and the sort of energy. Every walk of life talks about this. It's not just startups, it's, every, it's everything. So long story short, when you go home and turn on the electric light and you just sort of take it for granted and you assume that it's part of your productive economic life, just remember it took a titanic political effort to get there. And we'll need that at the local level from all of you in order to get to high capacity fiber networks throughout America. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you.